Welcome back to Northeast Pigeons, the best pigeon channel in the Northeast USA. With over 65 years of experience, national master breeder Rich Balin will be answering some of the most common breeding questions a fancier may have. Stay tuned. Thank you, Richie, for coming on to the show or the podcast, I should say. And, uh, you know, we're here to talk about pigeon breeding. I know you've been doing this for a long time, so you probably have a lot of knowledge. Also, being master breeder, congratulations on that. Couldn't have found a better participant. I always enjoy having you around and talking to you about pigeons. You have a lot of knowledge, and uh, it's great. So, you know, for myself and uh, a lot of new fanciers that are curious about breeding pigeons, what right. time of the year do you like to put your birds together? What time of the year of the year do you like to start breeding the birds? I usually start breeding. I put my pairs together um, anywhere between the the fourth week of March. Um, years back when I flew homes with my dad, uh, we put them together this weekend, president's weekend. Um, because, you know, back then many years ago, uh, we didn't have the, uh, you know, the hawk and the raptor problem that we have today. So anybody in January and February, I don't know what you do with them. If you fly them, you know, if you're not flying them, that's a different story. But if, you know, if you're flying them, like I do. You can't let young ones out this time of the year or February or even late March. You know, they're, they're, they're hunting like crazy. For, for me, it, it pays for me to put them together in late March. Um, the last couple of years, I've only gone one round with my birds because I've had some physical disabilities with uh, nerve issues. So it, it doesn't allow me to um, that I that I always used to love to and you know what as you're getting older you don't want to make this a job okay you know when I was 30 and 40 years old it was a different story today being 70 years old you want you you, ha you have to have a limit of what you can take care of so when it comes to pairing the birds I thought Valentine's Day was a hot time of the year for many people yeah it was for some people. We, my dad never put them together before. Well, President's Day was around Valentine's Day, the week after, um, as long as the weather was permitting. But that was when we put them together. When I was a kid, other than when I flew, when I, when I bred show flights back, it started in 1968. Prior to that, I never bred birds, you know, other than the homers. You know, if I, if I was flying, flying tiplets, you know, short face tiplets, if I wanted the bird store, you know, that was the bird stores were loaded years ago with beautiful pigeons you can go in for three, four five bucks and buy yourself a beautiful tiplet or a flight or whatever, a helmet, you know, that uh, everything is different today. So the guys that breed like really early on to the year, or I should say late year, like December and things like that, it's no good, right? If you're flying, that's for more flying. Like that's more for guys that are showing, I guess, if you're showing birds, you can breed any time of the year, but if Correct. you want to fly your birds, you want to do it more towards the springtime. Correct. I, I know that Mike Metagnus in Jersey, um, his Budapest early, but he also distributes those young ones to his friends. He doesn't mm -hmm. keep the first one. So for him, those 40 or 50 birds, he doesn't let them out to fly. They're gone. Which is a good idea, you know. Guy, you know, certain certain uh, in the country today um, are really into the Budapest high flyers, and they call him, and he's got great flying birds. And you know what? It, that works for him. I, uh, me, I'm trying to limit myself on uh, how many birds I'm going to breed. And then going back to the uh, time of the year for breeding. The, so, so what the, the problem is the hawks and the falcons, is that what it is? If you breed too early, you can't let them out. Oh. What, what happens if you hold the birds in and then wait till, you know, I guess the hawks and falcons have migrated or there's less around and then let those birds out. Are they just too strong on the wing or like, what are the downfalls of that then? Will they not stick? Is that it, the problem? It, They'll fly away, fly it, off. Getting birds when they're kept in for months before they're let out. They, the first thing is they're not used to being out. 
they're they're not strong on the wing, uh, and they they for some reason held in have a hard time landing. They don't know how to land. You know, it's like a it's like a baby learning how to walk. You know, if you don't teach that baby at a young age to walk, it's 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 never going to um, develop correctly. So young pigeons, you try to get them at least out on your board. They have, you know, guys with the homes, they have these big cages, these monkey cages or settling cages. And they get them out, you know, on the boards and they could see all around. My birds sit in the screen and they could see the surroundings there. But if they're not let out um, or they're, they're not, you know, able to move their wings and stretch their wings a little bit, um, it's, it's difficult. You wind up losing a lot of birds. How do you go about, you know, selecting the birds that you want to breed? What do you look at? I, well, with the flying flights, I, I look at all the outline uh, of the bird, uh, colors. Um, I just try to limit my, um, how many pairs. I mean, this year alone, uh, just with the dark teagues and dun teagues, I only have 10 pairs. That's it. Out of all the years I've had them, I only have 10 pairs of, of, of tigers. I got uh, five pairs of uh, yellows and reds, you know, yellow red and red tigers. Everything I'm trying to match up, um, what one bird has, maybe the other bird doesn't have. It, I try to get the qualities to fit with each other. Um, when, when I was going into the, the flying flights for show, Bob Schaefer taught me that, you know, building the house first, Making the outward is the first thing you want to do. And then you work on your markings, color, um, which that's what I've always learned. And my uncle, Alex Rawson, who was a master of the uh, 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 domestic show flights, he taught me the same thing. Get the outline of the oh. bird. Um, and if you got bad traits in a bird, if you have a bad, bad trait in a bird, like for a flying flight, a down face, um, heaviness in the beak, um, bad color, you know, you're just putting bad traits into the, into other birds. Be selected. So, so when you are selecting a head and a cock, are you choosing characteristics of each bird that like kind of complement each other? Or are you looking for similar traits in both of them? Well, you look for similar, but you're also looking for traits that will complement each other. Also, um, when it comes to color, I'm a nut for color, especially with blacks and duns and yellows. And, you know, if a yellow has, has a blue rump or a silver belly, it's no good. You're just putting a bad color trait into the bird, hoping that you'll, you'll possibly raise something good. But you, um, you really have to be strict when you're breeding for show. If, for flying, it's a whole different, you know, different ball game. Put my tiplets together. I got a few pairs of tiplets breeding, you know, for this year. And they're all beautiful birds. And I selected those birds to breed. And hopefully that, you know, I put them together. They'll not only be good flyers, but um, this year I had a little bit um, of success um, with the uh, with the Tiplers against the ATU. And I just enjoy doing it. You know, there's no, there's, there's no great thing with it. It's just the enjoyment of showing and being with the guys and, and being part of the hobby breeding for different colors and patterns and things like that i mean this is obviously all genetics so this goes back to recessive and uh what is it dominant genes that's what it is the yep. punnett square basically yep um, so is that something you just kind of read up on and you learned on your own or was it just more of a trial and error and figuring things out for me i think it was more true, but knowing that birds that the birds that I had years ago that had great color, I tried to keep that in there. Um, uh, mo most guys that know me know I have not purchased a lot of pigeons over the years. I usually breed family, um, which keeps the color. Um, I have borrowed a couple of birds, uh, you know, from uh, like Joe Nazario and I, we swap birds once in a while. Um, you know, he helps me, I help him, but um if I have a if a black is showing charcoal or it's it's not a, it's not a um, a black that's shiny and satiny out of it even a black tiger if it's got too much silver in it and which I don't usually get but you do get one once in a while and or or a dun tiger that is very um, is very washed you know not everyone is is perfect so what you do is you limit 
the birds that you're breeding from. You're trying to the best traits of of those birds into your breeders and be very selective. All right. So out of the 10 pairs that you're going to be working with this year, how many offsprings are you, you know, hoping to get out of them? How many rounds are you going to let them go? One round. That's, That's it. it. Because I have, right. I have eagles and dun tigers. I have five pairs of reds and yellow tigers, which is two pairs more than I wanted, but they're all beautiful. And I, I did give away two pairs to one of the guys in the club because those other two pairs were beautiful and I just couldn't hold all of these birds. That's that's 15, that's 15 pairs right there. I just did the blacks today. I got six pairs of those. I'll have three pairs of duns and then I'll have some a couple of pairs of blues and silver duns and that's it. So what about line breeding versus, uh, you know, inbreeding versus crossing bull system? Have you experimented with all these different breeding methods? Most most of my birds are um, line bred with my, my own family, or I've crossed birds from Joe Nazario into my certain traits of Joe's and certain traits of mine have come together both for him and for me. So... If there's a trait that he has that I'm looking for in a bird or, or a marking or a, a, a beak set, I will, he'll, he'll give me a bird that will help me with that. And I've done the same with him with birds. So, so where do his birds originate from? So, you know, I'm sure it's, you're introducing new blood into your family, right? Which is a good thing. Very little, very little but I'm very selective of what I bring in. Um, wh wh you're asking me where Joe started? Yeah. Do you have any idea what, uh, you know, bloodline or Joe, where his birds come from originally? He, he got some birds originally when he went back into the sport. Um, he got some birds from Ralph White. He got some birds from me. Um, I mean, when he came back into the sport, he didn't have anything. And I was done breeding that year. And I told him, Joe, go out whatever pairs you want and breed whatever you want because I'm all done breeding. And so he started off with my birds. Um, again, Joe is very selective. So when he was breeding his black tigers and dun tigers, he wanted his birds to have a better body. So he said, could I borrow one of your like, cocks? And I went, Joe, go in the coop and pick out the best dun in there and go with it. And he took that dun flight and he bred a dun beard out of it. And he took that dun beard and that, the second year that bird raised him the best to show winner. Okay. So it looks like uh, some of his bloodline does come from your original stock. So it's not like it's completely new bloodline when you do nope. get birds from him and you guys share birds back and forth or whatever the case is. And he has purchased, I, I know that he's got a little bit of Andrew's, uh, Andrew Franz's uh, birds in there. And he's got bird, a couple of birds from Frank Denegris that he's crossed in. Um, again, he's all the, the, the traits in the bird for show purposes. He's not breeding those flights anymore for flying purposes. As a matter of fact, he doesn't fly any flights anymore. He has all flying tippers now for that. When it comes to breeding, you know, fosters, I'm sure you don't use fosters, right? Because you have your 10 pairs, but have you you know, ever use fosters or have any experience with it for someone that might be interested in, you know, breeding certain birds? I've never, but I know that guys that have or domestic show flights use pumpers or foster parents. Mm -hmm. uh, they've had great success with them. Um, I, my father always taught me if a bird can't bring up its youngsters, it doesn't belong in your loft. So, I mean, I used to I have African owls for Chico's for the homers for droppers and they bred their own youngsters. never used homers for them. But you know, that was, that was years ago. I find the birds today are a lot weaker in body um, because, you know, guys have um, allowed them to get like that. I, even, even other breeds of birds, whether it's helmets or, or shooters or ball heads, the birds don't have, a lot of that flying body anymore they've lost a lot of the body and what would you blame like or who would you blame for that is there is it really anyone that you could point a finger at or would you say it's guys that are showing that are breeding out the flying you know traits and characteristics of birds the the show the, 
the domestic show flight, the, the domestic flying flight has, you know, gone very extreme. They're, they're most 40, 40 points out of their 100 points are from the neck up. They're, and a flying flight is a flying bird, like a flying tippler. The flying flight um, standard only has four points for conditioning, where the flying tippler has 57 or 60 points for conditioning. But they're both flying birds. So it, it, there's got to be, a, there's gotta be a, a, a happy medium somewhere. It'd be like a racing homer. If, if conditioning was only four points, where are you going to put the other points? You have to, you have, to have a, a flying bird should look and feel like a flying bird. Breeding season. Tell me about the diet. What are you feeding the birds? Uh, anything special? Anything different? Um, no, I I feed. Um, what I will do um, as they're breeding and it gets warmer outside, um, I might mix a bag of no corn with my regular feed with corn, so it cuts down on part of the corn because as as the summer comes they don't need as much corn but i know way but i do mix it with sometimes with a bag of um you know conditioner with no corn and obviously you know grit is very important to calcium and grit for the breeders yep. minerals with my birds um two three times a week they get fresh grit with minerals that i add into the grit and i shake it all up and they love it um, and even though they're not breeding now, my hens are eating it like crazy. I'm finding that the, the grit feeder in the, uh, in the hen section is, is empty in a day and a half. And what brand grit are you using and like the minerals and things like that? What brand do you like? I know there's red grit, I believe, and like a, a whiter or a gray color. Have you, you know, any preference in the two? Okay. I like the gray or the white grit, uh, because the red grit. Um, as they, you know, if they're, especially if they're feeding young ones, that, that red grit or that red coloring gets all over their necks and stuff. So I've never used that. Uh, I, I used it years and years ago. And I saw my, when I had the booties, they used to have red necks and stuff and getting that out of them is a pain. So from ba I believe it's from Baden and I mix it with the minerals that, um, uh, so it has, and, um, that all works for me. And that's it, right? The babies just eat the grains. You ever use pellets or anything like that to raise the young ones? I've never used pellets. Never. So I get, yeah, uh, I try, babies are coming out of the bowls. I take a bowl of food and I put it in the box. So when the, the cock or the hen pecks at it, you know, because I always clean the boxes so they're clean. And this way, the young ones, when they start coming out of the bowl, they can start following what the parents are doing by picking. And then when the birds are like three and a half weeks old, as as soon as I have the birds on the floor, all the young ones I take out of the boxes because they're all about the same age and they all go on the floor together. And the parents, I, I never get a pecked head. They all, all the parents feed them. They, they, the, the young ones, they, they learn how to eat faster in, in the hoppers. So they, they mature nicely. So when you say you, all the birds, you know, the young ones are around the same age, uh, do you ever toss like the first round of eggs or are you, so they're all, you know, I guess laying in sync in a sense, or do you, once you pair them up and once they start laying, you stick with whatever you have? Yep. I used to years ago though, because I put them together earlier. Um, but once I started breeding in late March and early April, um, I just put them together and I've had great success with that. You know, I would say 98% of my birds all drop eggs within a couple of days of each other. And so they're all hatching around the same time. If there's a pair that breeds exquisite birds, I might let it go a second round. Um, I know like last year I had what? I had 31 pairs. I banded 80 young ones. Oh, wow. But that, some were flyers, some were show birds, and some I got rid of, gave away. You know, you don't keep them. Um, you know, I, I, I try to keep the ones that I know are not for show that have a little something off and I put them in the flying section. So I usually push over about 30 youngsters, 30 to 35 youngsters into the old flyers, you know, because I only have one section for flying. 
So this year, the uh, temp pairs that you're working with, are they going to be for show or are they going to be for flying or a mix of both? Both. Okay. Because oh, I think I believe you usually like the miss marks and things like that, right? You usually kind of use those as your, your flyers. Yep. I mean, the flyers, I only have right, right at this second right now. I, I had 40 some odd. Um, I, I, I took a bad hit one day with uh, a, a Goshawk and a, and a Cooper. And I had, I was missing 28 out of the 40 yeah. something. And I fill out nine out of those birds. And some of them are old birds. And my birds route like homers. They just got tired of being chased. Did they ever come back or did you end up losing a lot? Those nine, I never got back. Oh, wow. You'd get four back within three days. They were they they you know, on the bundle loft and stuff. They were beat up a little bit. Um, one had a couple of tail feathers missing. So it's just it it's become um the birds don't even want to come out of the coop. When I when I went to the bird store this morning uh with uh, Joe Jasinski and Joe Nazario, I came back. It was beautiful this morning. I got home it was a quarter to eleven. I said, you know what, I'm gonna go out and open up the coop door. So my wife stepped out on me and she goes, are the birds flying? I went, no. The door's wide open. Not one bird came out of the loft. Not one. Oh, wow. They're all in Why the nest box. Get free. Oh, okay. 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 They're I was going to say, do they sense some sort of danger or something? Or are they just, they're just smart birds that are just trying to stay and raise the young? They're, they're, they're safe. Um, the, the other day they were out, I, I, I opened up the door. The a bunch of the cocks came out, you know, just slapping around a little bit. There was about 20 out, out of the 30, out of the 31. And one one tiplet came out, one gun grizzle came out and flew around, made a couple of swings low. And then the 20, 20 went off. They made three swings. And with, before I could blink my eye, the female Cooper hawk was on top of them. I mean, she wow. must have a nest two, three blocks away from here and see them because they weren't up. They were only up over the treetop. So... Um, she has to be nesting nearby and she comes in a, less than a minute after I fly it. So she got, they got away. They stayed up high for about a little over an hour. Then they lowered out. She came back again. She didn't get anything. And then they, when they dropped, they ran right in. I mean, you've got to see, they run in like racing homers. And these are your breeders too, that you're Those, letting out to fly? Well, all the birds that are flying are none of them are my breeders. Oh, okay. I have one one flyer in there. I looked at her band the other day. It's a 2012. Uh, there's another one in there. It's a 2011. Those birds have been here all this time. I've gone through hawk chases, night flies, overflies. It's amazing that they're still here. Wow. Yeah, that's quite a bit of time. Yep. When it comes to nesting material, what is your you know preferred? You know, straw. Substrate. straw really I use, yeah i do i use i use straw i bought a whole um a few quite a few years ago from joe and you know i just take i don't use a ton of it all the time i put a little pile in each section and the birds take it and they make their nests i also like pine needles if i can get them if, if i go to my friend's house i'll take a bag of pine needles and i'll so um but most of the time, it's I use the straw. So I've heard people advise against the straw. They say that it, um, you know, harbors bugs and uh, I guess moisture and things like that will stay inside. I mean, have you, you know, heard about anything like this or had it, any bad experience? I've never had a. First of all, my birds, the young ones. I mean, I the summertime. When the summertime comes, almost everybody has gets lice. Where it comes from, I don't know. I don't bring strange birds in. So when my birds would go to shows, they don't have lice. But in the summertime, if you go in the law, I'm, and you'll pick up a bird and you'll go, wow, where did that come from? You know, you'll see a few pieces of lice on them. But I clean the nest bowls. Like once the eggs, once the eggs hatch, I don't bother them for at least, at least a week. I don't touch them. I just look in there to see if they're hatched. Everything is good and ban them. That's when I, I, I'll start cleaning in the bowls. And if I have to take out some of the straw, I do. And then I'll put some new stuff down. If I have to take some straw out, you know, because when young ones, when they start to get like two weeks, two and a half weeks old, they're crapping like crazy. So it gets kind of messy and it gets kind of damp. And then I clean the whole bowl out. 
when it comes to the nesting bowls, there's different types. There's paper types, plastic, clay. I know you use the clay bowls, but have you tried any of the other ones? Any reason why you like the clay bowls? Because I've collected them since I'm 10 years old, and I must have about 80 of them. Um, I just uh, We just bought some. Uh, uh, Joe Nazario and Rick Ackerman just bought... Uh, unfortunately, two of the home, uh, two of the uh, guys in the club passed away in the last month. So bowls, but I only use the clay um, because that they've worked. It's worked for me all these years. I got them since I'm a kid. My father had some of those uh, Belgium uh, plastic ones, the red ones, and and when he passed away, I brought you know I I sent a box of stuff that I wanted to keep from him here and they were in the garage for about five or six years and and joe nazario said you got any extra nest bowls and i said yeah i do i said here take this dozen nest bowls and he uses the the, the rubber you know the plastic ones but he puts the pads in there he does the pads and he does some you know straw and nesting material he does use the same stuff as you don't put any pads or anything in your bowls right you just leave the hay nope. for the birds and they build their own nest and that's that yep that's it. Sometimes right. when the, when I'm in the nest bowls, when after there's young ones in there, and I take the old straw out and stuff, if I am going to breed another pair, um, because after one round I take the bowls away and they're done. So, but if I am going to leave that pair to breed another round, I take all the straw out, I clean the whole nest bowl, and then I have litter on the floor, and I take some litter and I put it in the bowl and I scrape it all around with it. And then I just use, I leave a little bit of a light, very, very light. That's all. And then the fuck they, I put some new straw in there and the birds go to town on the eggs. What size are the bowls that you use? I, I mean, are they smaller than the traditional bowls in like diameter? No. Um, I forget the diameter because there's wider ones. I do have some of the wider ones. It's oh, a, a little over a foot, you know, in, in diameter, but I have the smaller ones. I guess they're about eight or 10 inches. They're about 10 inches round. Okay. They're bigger right. than a dog. Bowl. And like I said, I've never had a problem with them. I like the smaller nest bowls because when sitting on the babies, there's not that much space for them to spread out. This way, one young one can't, you know, Scoot out from underneath the mother. This way, they're 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 sitting tight on all the time. Oh wow! So I I never even like considered that or gave that a thought. So that's actually pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. You prefer something either as medium medium size in a sense. That way, yeah, the babies and everything are closer together, and the mom is definitely covering mm -hmm. both of them. Yeah, because years ago, a guy gave me about. 10 or 12 bowls but they were high and they're wide at the bottom and really they're for homers those particular type bowls they were high up you know they came up like this and i realized like even when the birds were sitting on eggs they'd sit in the egg and one egg was here and the other egg was underneath them i said you know what this is not good for me those bowls and i fire once you pair your birds together right uh when do you medicate you know, what do you do? Um, I don't medicate while I'm breeding. Um, I wormed my birds two weeks ago. Uh, tomorrow, I will treat them for canker, uh, which I do every year before I breed. So they're all wormed already. Um, and I'll treat them with inheptin, uh, which I have uh, in, in my... And I'll treat them for canker, and that's it. I put them... My birds are on uh, probiotics four days a week with garlic and uh, garlic and vitamins in it. I put the, I mix them together like this morning. They got a, they got a spoonful of each in the water. Um, the one thing I start doing um, about weeks before I put the birds together, I start using uh, wheat germ oil blend in the, on top of the feed almost every day. So the hens, especially the young hens, they don't have a problem passing the egg through. So you don't have a problem with, birds getting egg bound okay so that's what the wheat germ oil is for oh yeah that's i learned that with the show flights years ago years ago and ever since i've been breeding uh, birds even with the booties when i had them years ago as soon as i started breeding you know before i was putting them on you know wheat germ oil 
and uh, mix it with the feed, and they all get it, whether it's flaw. I don't, I don't, uh, uh, you know, disseminate w- what uh, what's going to you know get fed. All my birds get the same exact feed, whether they're flyers or they're breeders or they're show birds. They all get the same. They all, all right. get clean water day. They all get clean feed. They all get clean grit. At what age do you band your birds? Um, if well, I band everything. Um, but if if I know that it's going to be a, if it's not a real good one or it's a real ugly one or something like that, I might not band it and get rid of it as soon as it hits the floor. I'll either bring it to the store or bring it to the auction or give it away to somebody. I'd rather I'd rather give somebody but 99 times out of 100 i i banned everything at anywhere between you know eight eight to 12 days eight to 12 okay and uh what size band do the flights usually get flights get number eight npa bands so what are some of the uh the most common you know breeding problems that you've seen or you've experienced and how have you you know, combat of that or taking care of that. I hear a lot over the years where the young birds in the nest, one is dying, one is not. Um, and I'm hearing that a lot this year already from guys. Um, and again, I'm not breeding yet. So I, I don't normally run into that yeah, every once in a while. Yeah. You'll have a dead young one or one, but some guys are telling me that one young one is one size and the other one is twice the size, which means Either the bird is not well, or there's something going on in the loft. Um, ones that are dying in the in the nest, uh, either the parents are not feeding them correctly, or you might either have salmonella or paratyphoid in the loft. It's, you know, it's a common it's a common thing, especially with the damp weather that we had for those weeks. You know, when you're breeding in damp weather, the the coops aren't heated, the door the windows are open. I mean, my loft is open, you know, all day long. I don't shut the windows unless it's a blizzard or it's 20 degree, uh, 20, uh, you know, minus 20 out. And we don't get that kind of weather here. But, you know, just today it was 22 degrees and I opened up, you know, the, the big the coop that was open this morning at quarter to seven. Are you using breeding cages or, you know, individual pens or is it just an open loft type of system that you have going on right now? Um, I, I pair my garage on the breeding pens that you saw when you were here the last time. So now that I have my pairs together this week, now that I put those six pairs of blacks together, I will take those six pairs of blacks and bring them in the garage, leave them in there for the day. Then I'll put them back in the coop, separate hens and cocks. So when I come in the garage after a couple of days, um, I could leave them in there in the cages, but I like to put them back in the coop so they feel comfortable. But this and this way they long for their mate. This way, when you put them back in the cage, they mate right up. And this way, when I do put them in the boxes in the loft, all my all my breeding fronts, they're they're all they're all you know wooden nest fronts that I had made, and each each pair gets only one box. I do not allow birds to get more than one box. Do you lock them up in those boxes too? Like when when you do put them in to kind of get used to yeah. it, or how does that work? Like the year before, like whatever, if I have cocks that I was breeding out of last year, I know where they are because I have it written down. I have a a, um, a chart. So I know which cock that I bred out of last year and I put him back in the same box. This way the hen follows him and he goes up to that box. He's not going in and fighting with a, another bird. Okay. All right. Some guys their boxes but I can't do that because I have two sections. So one section's a hens and one's a cocks. So I, I, I'll, I'll put them in those boxes and I'll, I'll buy. And then during the day, I'll open up the box after, you know, I'll let a couple of pairs out at a time, let them eat and drink. And the cock will go back to the box and the hen usually follows after about, after about four or five days, you got them all going back in the boxes. For someone that is uh, breeding, whether new or experienced, you know, what is one advice that you can give them or what's your best advice as far as breeding goes? Ask questions, sure, of something. Ask questions. You find 
you know, find a, find a breeder, whether it's me or anybody else, try to search out a breeder that, that is close by you or that you can ask questions to. Um, if you're not sure and you're, um, it, it's better than guessing, you know, a lot of guys, um, if, if their birds are sick or they're a new, they're a new breeder of pigeons, they don't even know what they're looking at. You know, ask somebody, you know, the birds have watery droppings. They're green. What should I do? First thing they do is they go to the bird store and they don't take a picture of the dropping or what it looks like. And they say to either, you know, Gail or, or the, uh, John over by at Andrews or whatever. So you're starting to give your birds medications that might not work. Overcrowding is a huge, is a huge no, no. And I've learned that myself over the years. Um, especially today, you know, I used to have 45 pairs of breeders cause I have a lot of colors. I don't need 45 pairs of breeders. I'm down to about I'm tops. I'm down. I'm going to have 30 pairs this year and I'd like to get it to 25, but I had to, I really had a great year last year. So I, I either culled out what I didn't need or want anymore, or I gave some birds away to guys to breed out of because they're really nice pigeons. And I wanted to have guys have, you know, have some success with them. The best tip for a breeder, whether you're showing, flying, whatever, um, feed costs money. And it costs the same money to feed a good one than it does a piece of garbage, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, most, most guys like, you know, they have pride in what they keep. So if you have a small coop that's six by eight and you want to keep 50 or 60 birds in their tops, that's fine. Don't put a hundred in there. There's no reason for it. First of all, today, you're not catching any strays today. The guys in Brooklyn, uh, that's the only place where they're, they're, they're catching a few here and there. But out here in the island or, or even in Jersey, you know, all they're finding is strays that, you know, people lost because of the hawks. And during the wintertime, most guys are not flying right now. You're going to meet some great people, um, you know, in, in this hobby. And, you know, it, it's going to it's going to allow you to expand on your hobby and, and the love for the pigeons. That's what I, I try to stress that with everybody. It's, it is a fun hobby. You, you know that you've done it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping to get back into it hopefully this year, or next year. So we'll see how things yep. go. Yeah. The hobby needs a guy like you. You're not only do you help the hobby by interviewing people. Um, Cause I enjoy listening to all these Potter I'm on it or not, or whether you or the guy Matt runs it or whoever. Um, I enjoy it. I, I watched Frank's the other day when you did his last week. It's very informative. Um, even as an experienced person, I like to listen to what people do. I go, hey, you know what? That's a good idea. I did that before. I'm going to try that, no matter what it is. Yeah, definitely. There's a. It's it's like never ending. You know, there's there's a lot yep. to learn, and uh, you know some of the things we may not agree on, but right. it's just still interesting to get someone else's uh, perspective. And it's somebody might agree on one thing and you don't agree on the other thing. Well, you know what? Everybody has their lofts. Everybody has a different form of loft management. That's also key when you're breeding for show or racing loft management, keeping the loft dry, no drafts, um, making sure the water is clean. I'm a firm believer in clean water. I uh, I don't leave my water can even in the summertime, when when I have the big water is in there, my birds get clean water twice a day. You know, and I, I'll ask a breeder, so you'll leave water for two days in the heat. Don't you like to have a nice drink of fresh water? Would you drink out of a bowl that's been sitting out in the heat all day long? You're not going to like that. Mm -hmm. Well, your birds don't like it either. Yep. And uh, that's probably why your birds are healthier too. As I said, people that know me, I don't medicate unless I have to, which is very, very rare. I'm a firm believer in the probiotics that I give them uh, and the garlic and, and vitamins with the, and the grit, clean grit, clean, clean feed is also 
You can't have feed in a damp atmosphere. I don't leave feed in the in the troughs, especially in damper weather, because the dampness penetrates, whether it's in the coop. I don't ever feed my birds in the screen either. My birds get fed in the coop and they have to come into the screen to get their water. There's no water inside the coop. Okay. So, you know, some of the things that you are adding to the feed, uh, you know, the garlic or to the water, I should say, the garlic and the probiotics, do you think the birds in the long run become dependent on these? Nope. Or, you know, if you were to stop it all of a sudden, would your birds like get sick or not do well because they're so used to, you know, having those, you know, food or whatever, you know, vitamins mixed into their water? We'll call it additives. I really can't tell you because I've been, if I tell you that I've been giving them vitamins and garlic for over 40 years. So I'm breeding flights 40 years this year. And I was giving it to the booties when I had them for 10 years. So I'm, I'm using garlic and, and vitamins, you know, 50 years. Mm -hmm. I've, and I mean, there's a couple of days here and there that I don't give it to a quarter. But I just know that I've had great rea I've had great um, reactions and success with it. The birds look great. Their eyes are always clear. Um, I don't get. Somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, "How often do I get one eye colds in the in the birds?" I'm like, I can't. This time the bird had an eye cold. Another question I wanted to ask you is, um, I, I think I know the answer to this, but. The birds that you do keep in your garage, you never worry about rodents or anything like that? No, I don't feed them in there. No, no, no. I don't keep oh. them in the garage. I take them up in the garage. Feed and water for them in the garage. So well, I do so even the birds that, you're, that are in quarantine, though, that are in the garage, or you know, when you're pairing them, you don't give them feed and water? When I'm pairing them up, there's no feed and water in there for them. When I'm quarantining them after the show... I put, I have small uh, feeders that some guy made for me when I was like 15 years old, one of the homer flyers. And I put those in there and I let them eat and drink. I have very small, those small watering cans, you know, the ones that the two piece ones, they eat and drink. And then when they're all done, I take the feed out, put it back in the can, take the water out, anything dropped in the floor, I sweep it up. That's it. Okay. Cause I, I mean, I was considering maybe getting some cages for myself. So I have uh, something, you know, at the moment, but my right. main concern was, uh, you know, them, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> them making a mess. And then, you know, we have a lot of garbage or junk in the garage and well, it's not really garbage, but to me it is. Uh, but you know, it's, I was just worried that they're going to get in the mice and the rats and start destroying everything and chewing through all the boxes and going through my mom's stuff. So that's why I was kind of avoiding that for now. It's it's something to think about. As I said, I mean, when I'm mating up the birds, I'll throw a pair in there. Like you know, when I did the blacks today, I put birds in the cages together. I looked at them. They stayed together for a while. Some of them made it right up. Some of them didn't. Some of them were a little shy, but they're all back in the coop now. They ate and drank. I'll, I'll, they need any more feed water and, and an hour from now I'll shut the light off and they'll bye bye till tomorrow. But if I'm quarantining birds in the garage, they do get feed and water, but I make sure that, um, whatever, if they do knock anything over on the floor, I sweep it up. Yeah. Okay. Makes I, sense. Or that the seals at the bottom of my garage doors close all the way down because you know if those seals don't you know go all the way to the ground nice and tight you will you will get mice in your garage people didn't even look at those seals you know those rubber seals mm -hmm. yep the garage door yeah yep they don't need they don't need a lot of space to get in a little field no. mice when I, when I was in Levittown and I had a shed I used to find baby mice in my in my pool cover you know because they got in he couldn't help it, but you know, I'd un unravel it, maybe mice in there, you know, with the mother, and I'm like, oh my god, you know. But he, the leaving stuff, I don't leave feed open. All my feed are uh, all my feeds and grits are in plastic, you know, garbage cans with a liner. I use a uh, a black trash can liner inside of that, 
and all my feed goes in there. Leave any open bags of anything in the garage. What is a liner like? Why, why a liner? What does that do? Is it just extra protection or? It's it keeps it dry. You know, I mean okay. the, the, the plastic. So it's only the feed. I have a I have a small bucket, um, like a like a Home Depot bucket with a, that I have my candy in. I I put I get I I give my birds candy at least, um three to four days a week, even when they're not breeding. How much of it? Mm, uh, small, like a small Folgers can like this big. I'll split that up between the three sections. That's it. You know, it's like a tree. Okay. I don't give my birds peanuts. I know that birds love the peanuts. I've never given my birds peanuts. So the you candy know, I, though, <clears throat> they get that with their feed as well in, in addition, or is it just separate? No. Feed, I give the birds their feed, and then if like if I was now, and um, I wanted, to, I gave them candy yesterday, so I probably wouldn't give them any more candy today. But the candy's good because of the oils in the feed are good for the feathering. So you want to keep that feathering looking good too. You want it brilliant. You want the blacks to look satin. You want the nice and dark. You want the reds to shine. Um, I, I'm I'm a fanatic on that. All and right. when you put the when you put the wheat germ oil blend or a cod liver oil or whatever you use, whatever oils you use on top of your feed and, and the birds are eating, it's great for the feathering birds. It's great for the young ones and the hens that are laying eggs. Well, thank you, Rich, for coming on to the podcast. Uh, very informative as usual. Uh, I look forward to connecting with you again when the weather gets nicer. Hopefully get a few guys together and, uh, you know, just talk about different topics once again regarding the we'll, pigeon hobby. We'll do that in the spring. And then we'll have the guys over in my yard. You'll do this podcast with a bunch of the pigeon guys. It'll, it'll be a nice thing. Be, Definitely. Be good. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks again. Have a great night. Thank you again.